Hi, everybody. Thank you for uh, logging on. We'll just give it a few more minutes until some other folks have a chance to join, um, and then we'll get started. So sit tight. Okay, now feels like a good time to get started. Um, hi, everybody. Welcome to our program this evening called Continued Conversations, Mapping the Mystic River. Uh, my name is Megan Nally. I am the Public Engagement Coordinator at the Leventhal Map and Education Center. And for now, I'm joined on screen, I think this way, by our Assistant Director, Emily Bowe. Hi, Emily. Hi, Megan. Uh, tonight's talk is the fourth in the latest programming series that we are calling Continued Conversations. And in this series, we're talking with folks who work either in the geographic or the issue areas of our current environmental justice exhibition. Uh, the exhibition is titled More or Less in Common, Environment and Justice in the Human Landscape, and looks at the relationship between environmental management and historic patterns of injustice on the local, national, and global scale. For those of you watching who are local to Boston, we would very enthusiastically invite you to come see the exhibition in person. It will be on display in Copley Square um, now through December. But for those who are unable to make it in person, we do have an accompanying digital exhibition um, with all the same objects, captions, interactive tools, um, et cetera. And you're welcome to check that out whenever you would like. Uh, before we begin tonight's program, we would like to take note of both the complicated and contested threads that are woven through historical geography, um, including difficult stories that not, we can't um, ignore or should we ignore. Uh, the place that we now call Boston is the ancestral home and current home to indigenous peoples, including the Mashpee and Aquina Wampanoag tribes, the um, Nipmuc nations and the Massachusetts people. The maps in our collections um, not only bear witness to these stories of colonial expropriation, but also to conflicts ranging from labor struggles to racial segregation. Um, and in some cases, these maps don't simply document those stories, but actually played a role in making them happen in the first place. So during tonight's program and during all our programs, um, we do encourage you to consider how these histories still exert real effects on the present day. Um, my dog is in the background, so I apologize if you hear any barks. Um, but for tonight's conversation, we're so excited to be joined by folks from the Mystic River Watershed Association. Um, I'll pass it over to them to introduce themselves. We have Daria Clark, who is their engagement manager, Natalia Bayona, their watershed educator, and Julie Wormser, senior policy director. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having us. Excited to be here. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, I'd love to just hear a little bit more about your organization before we jump into tonight's um, presentation. Sure. Um, we are a 50-year-old organization uh, celebrating our 50th anniversary this year, and we work toward a vibrant, healthy, and resilient Mystic River watershed for the benefit of all of our community members. And in achieving this, we uh, protect water quality through water testing throughout the, the watershed. We restore important habitat. Um, we build for climate uh, resilience and we transform parks and paths along the river. And we inspire youth and community members through immersive education and volunteer programs. So Daria can share a little bit more about how to get involved. Yeah, thanks Natalia. And thanks for the great intro, Megan. Um, like Megan mentioned, I'm the engagement manager at the Mystic River Watershed Association. And I just wanna share that we have a lot of fun opportunities and events to explore and protect the Mystic River watershed. And we would love for you to join us. Um, we'll share our website in the chat and invite you to subscribe to our monthly newsletter or follow us on social media to hear about um, all of our latest fun news and events um, that you can plug into, including joining us out on the river itself, which is my lovely background here. Um, so yes, excited to chat and hopefully meet all of you in person at some point. I'll pass it back to Emily to get started. 
Yeah. So before we kind of dive into Julie's presentation, we thought um, it might be interesting to sort of look at uh, maps that maybe show some deeper historical perspectives for uh, how we got where we are today. So I'm just going to show a couple maps. Uh, some are from our collections and some are not. <laughs> and um, we'll sort of talk through what we see in them and what's what's interesting about them. Um, I think Megan's gonna help me by putting some of the links in the chat as we go through it, but I'm going to uh, share my screen and start with a map that um, is very famous amongst uh, Boston history and cartographic uh, history sort of fans. Um, we frequently call it the Pelham map. It was done by a cartographer named uh, Henry Pelham, who was actually a British loyalist. Um, and this is done kind of around the time of the Revolutionary War. Um, it's one of the most detailed maps of the greater Boston area that we have from that period. So there's a lot of really interesting historical research, especially around kind of what was the shape of Boston at this time, where was water, where was salt marsh, um, kind of what were the military fortifications at the time. This is a 1777 map. So, um, and I'll take you through it real quick. So uh, there's a fun little inset up here that actually has a little inscription that talks about how Henry Pelham has been given um, kind of rights from the king to be able to survey these places, including and behind areas behind enemy lines. Um, but you can start to see as you look at it that <clears throat> this is a pretty detailed kind of take on what uh, what the landscape of this area looked like at the time. So, you know, here we'll zoom in on what was sort of the Shawmut Peninsula of Boston at the time. Um, individual buildings aren't marked. Uh, in, in this part of Boston, but you can see there's little uh, like little letters that are marking different places. And then these larger blocks that are showing sort of more of an urban urban landscape at the time. Um, north is kind of oriented up and to the right. Um, so it's, it's a bit of a different uh, view than what I think most people are used to seeing when they think about a map of Boston, but you can see the uh, Mystic or Medford River is, is noted here sort of going up the map, uh, up to Malden, and eventually up to Medford. Um, and <clears throat> what's now Chelsea Creek isn't marked on this, but that's right here, kind of going uh, along, you know, Noddle Island is eventually what becomes East Boston. So you can start to see kind of what this looks like at the time of the revolution. Um, much of this are these salt meadows and these sort of marshy landscapes here, these, um, I don't know if it's easy to see, but this little kind of hatching that happens here is sort of the cartographer's way of showing that it's not solid land. It's it's kind of some sort of uh, marshy, sort of not quite not quite solid. Um, and these these darker lines are showing the where the solid land actually is. So you can kind of see where the marsh picks up over here, um, <clears throat> kind of in Cambridge, Somerville area. Um, but this is not marked on this map, but this is the Island's End um, River. And it's, it's a good thing to sort of follow over time, especially through history and these maps, to think about the changes that have happened along the Mystic. Um, and you can see it kind, of, it, it kind of creeps all the way back into land. And I'll go quickly to, uh, this is it today. I mean, in, in a Google map, just for ease of showing you, you'll see We've oriented north slightly differently, right? So uh, we are now, uh, the Mystic is sort of running left to right instead of up and down. And this is now what Island, Island End River looks like. Um, and you can see it, it sort of ran much further. Uh, and all of this has been infilled <clears throat> over time. Um, so I'll move to the next map, which is actually, I'm moving around here. So this is um, a map oops, from, the state libraries, uh, and it's from 1845. So jumping forward in time a bit. Um, and it was produced by the uh, Board of Harbor Commissioners, which um, at the time had a lot of uh, kind of regulatory power because they were basically the ones that were setting uh, the sort of terms for uh, trade and uh, kind of movement of goods along these waterways. So they kind of these maps and, and their um, sort of records of things oops, uh, are, are very important for this time period. 
Oh goodness. Screen shares are not working. Okay, let's try this one more time. So, um, <clears throat> but what you can see in this map um, is the kind of extensive wetlands that are these kind of, you can start to, if I zoom in a little bit, you'll see they've got tiny little marsh uh, in illustrations kind of all through here. Um, and you can see how much of uh, what's shown on this waterway is actually uh, kind of this marshy wetland area. Um, and you've got the Malden River here, uh, and then I believe the Island End River here, kind of not labeled again. Um, but much of this land sort of isn't the landforms that we know today. And much of this becomes filled over time, but at this point is sort of still coastal wetlands. And at this moment, um, you know, in the kind of mid 19th century, coastal wetlands were viewed primarily as a sort of problem to be solved or to be a problem to be managed, uh, particularly because they were the sites of dumping grounds for trash, sewage, um, waste, in like industrial waste. Um, and so the Board of Harbor Commissioners, because of their sort of regulatory powers for these waterways, ends up being kind of one of the, maybe the original environmental regulatory agencies, though that term wouldn't have been used at the time. Uh, and they're because they're trying to keep the harbor passable for ship traffic um, to sort of and to ensure that locations for industrial facilities that might have uh, off waste or some kind of pollution are sort of sited suitably for that kind of transportation goal. Um, so this is the it's it's uh, it's not a particularly super colorful map, but it's an interesting one to sort of see. Uh, flowing all the way to the Mystic Pond, kind of where the, the landscape was at that moment in time. So jumping back here, we'll go to another map in our collection. Um, that's, it's uh, about maybe 30 years later. Um, so this is 1878. And at this moment in time, uh, the city of Boston is having to contend with, um, and the region in general is having to contend with increased population growth, uh, new housing, new industry that's sort of built up along uh, many of its waterways. And it's having to deal with all of these issues of um, infrastructure. And one of the things that is starting to be considered are these um, kind of water supplies, where water flows, where the boundaries of these watersheds are, not the least of which because uh, Boston is considering uh, a kind of a combined um, sewage uh, management plan. And so the sewers, there's all these maps that are being drawn at this time, sort of creating the, what will become the sort of ringed sewer system to dispose of waste. So there's a lot of maps at this time that are drawn looking at these different watersheds um, that are kind of affected by these things. But so zooming in on the Mystic Watershed here, um, this is showing the drainage area of the Mystic Watershed um, of the Upper Mystic. And it's kind of the through Winchester and Woburn and Stoneham. Um, and the, you know, the connect, there's a connection here um, for anyone who's seen our exhibition or um, hasn't, but can see it online. There's a, in, another map that's in the exhibition that's interesting that looks at the, um, the drainage area of the Stony Brook. Um, and, you know, what's interesting about these, you know, now and then are that these boundaries sort of have no bearing on these sort of political jurisdictions or the governmental jurisdictions. And so they present these really interesting challenges, uh, you know, from not only a policy perspective, but also an environmental one. And, you know, these maps are being drawn by engineers, but it's this kind of constant um, kind of bumping of the challenges of kind of environmental management as things are cutting across municipal lines. Um, and increasingly, you know, that that we, we see those things, not just with the, these watershed issues, but there's another map in the exhibition right now that's looking at um, noise pollution and thinking about kind of proximity to Logan Airport and sort of who's most affected by noise pollution and, you know, how that's regulated, but also like who's using the airport and all of these things where, you know, the sort of proximity to a, a point or a site um, starts to sort of uh, come at odds with with any kind of uh, administrative or municipal uh, authority. So, um, anyway, this is a really interesting map, and there's there's a lot other of other maps like these in our collections that are showing these different boundaries of watersheds. Um, so I'll go to the next one, which um, 
is a map from um, <clears throat> 1890. So just a few years later, about 10 years later, um, that's the Boston, uh, the, the Board of Harbor and Land Commissioners. So this map is in uh, in our show. Uh, it's actually here and you can come see it in person. But for now, you're going to see it on my screen. And the two things to really pay attention to here are the the kind of ways that industry is regulating land formation uh, at this moment in time along the river. So if you zoom in a little bit, um, you'll start to see these red lines um, and some of them say pier headline and some of them say bulk headline, which at this moment in time, the Harbor and land commissioners have been uh, given the regulatory authority to basically define how far into the river the structures can extend. So that's the pier headline. And then you'll see, you know, here there's this long kind of pier that just barely doesn't quite hit the pier headline. And then the bulk headline is, for all intents and purposes, the line, uh, the, the boundary of what could be considered kind of like built land. And it's not about structures extending into a waterway. It's sort of the limits to where land would be built that's, that's considered kind of ground. Um, and so you'll see these lines that along the river are starting to set kind of what will become more modern boundaries um, and, you know, start to be these hard edges that have no sort of relationship to the kind of natural forms that you see here. Um, and this is, you know, really kind of portending the sort of industrial shape that these waterways will take, especially in the siting of uh, new industry kind of after 1890, but also around this time. Um, so you'll see some some places on the map, the pier heads and the bulk headline are, are the same. You see um, kind of here, right? It's it's following the railroad. Uh, that's sort of where the, the boundary extends to, but other times it's, uh, it's kind of, as long as it's maintaining this kind of passable channel, uh, they, they sort of, the pier headline is extended about as far out as it could possibly be to ensure that the channel um, or the creek or um, the harbor is still navigable per the, the sort of purview of this land commissioner. Um, and Island River, Island End River is dead center kind of in this one. And you'll see, uh, we're starting to maybe see something that looks closer to what um, is present in, in current maps and in what you see in, in current day um, kind of Island End River. And the last photo that I want to show is actually, or last thing I want to show is a photo, not a map. Um, and it's this kind of very dramatic aerial photo. So this is from um, <clears throat> some sometime between 1955 and 1964. And it's from the Northeastern Library Repository. Um, and it's just this really dramatic um, kind of image of what kind of ultimately ended up happening to the river uh, from when this was taken back to, you know, the, the map I just showed you, which was 1890. So the perspective is kind of hovering above Charlestown. Um, Island End River is, is sort of to the right, um, just to the right over here. And uh, Malden River goes through the middle of the photo right here. And then um, the Mystic kind of continues upward to the upper left. Um, and the elevated train tracks that you'll see here and here um, are the former route of the elevated railway from Sullivan Square into Everett across what's known as um, the Alfred Street Bridge. The new um, Wynn Casino is kind of basically dead center in the photo, um, sort of above the elevated railroad. And, you know, it's it's kind of a great example. You know, I showed those maps that show all of the marshland that was kind of surrounding the water at one point in time. And it's kind of this very dramatic um, depiction of sort of how that marshland basically just got turned into flat industrial wasteland um, and you know that's that's it's it's sort of on display here um, so anyways that's that's kind of what I wanted to to set the scene for and I, now Julie I think can come in and take us to a more present day perspective and show us um, kind of where things are headed and maybe how we can change it Julie, I think you got to unmute.
There we go. I was having a hard time unmuting. So um, let me just put this on slideshow. Um, that was fascinating. And you will see some of these maps um, repeated um, in terms of going from past marshes to future flooding. So our ancestors sure set us up with a design challenge when they chose to fill all of our marshes. So um, as I mentioned before, I'm the senior policy advisor for the Mystic River Watershed Association, and I lead our climate resilience work in the region. So when you think about climate vulnerabilities, particularly in Boston, thank God we don't have tornadoes generally. Thank God we don't have wildfires, but we do have increasingly heat, uh, intensive rainfall, and of course, sea level, sea level rise and coastal storm surges. So some of these things um, our communities can handle on a place by place basis. So heat is something where it's extremely local. You can be fine in your well-insulated house that has air conditioning or shady trees around it, while your neighbor is sweltering in poor housing or even unhoused. Um, so these uh, local strategies um, are really on a very site-by-site -site basis. Um, when you're thinking about managing intensive rainfall, snowmelt to some extent, but predominantly rainfall, that both has local and regional strategies. In um, cities, as you see on the right, which is um, Cambridge and Central Square, when the rain falls so intensely, it's really flooding down. It's not going downstream, it's going um, vertically down and causing localized flooding so intense that um, you really have to manage it on site. So there's a, a huge, um, I can't even remember how many million gallon it's a 50 million gallon tank of um, that holds that much water underneath Central Square to protect the neighborhood around it. In other ways, we can um, absorb water upstream um, in, the, in the upper part of our watershed to prevent more flooding downstream. And that's one of the things we're trying to do. The thing about coastal flooding is um, you can't tackle that on a site-by-site -site basis. If you think about a bathtub, imagine elevating half of your bathtub um, with solid uh, china and have elevating the other part of it with a screen. Um, you wouldn't actually be able to hold water in your perfectly um, armored side of your bathtub. It would just go through the screen. Um, you've also might have heard of strategies to manage coastal flooding by doing floating wetlands. That does a lot for dampening waves, but it wouldn't change the elevation of the ocean just as a sponge in a bathtub doesn't prevent the bathtub from flooding. So our challenge with the coastline is it's truly a regional um, solution. The challenge we have in this area, however, is we have no counties for all intents and purposes. New England in general has very weak counties, but Massachusetts, we all but abolished ours except for Cape Cod. So in the Mystic watershed, we're only the size of like Amsterdam or um, Brooklyn, New York, but we have 21 cities and towns sharing a similar square mileage. It's 1% of Massachusetts it's about 10% of our population, but we have no regional government. You, your slides for whatever reason aren't, they're not transitioning. Uh, we're just, we're still on the first slide. Still on the first one. Okay, let me. reshare. That'll that'll do the trick. I will do that. Um, I think what I need to do, hmm, thank you for telling me because I was doing all sorts of fancy things. <laughs> um, hmm. I think I can. Um, if I can't do it, then I will just do it without. Um... Julie, I think if you do full screen now before you share, and then when you share, pick the like full screen window, that might be what we need. Um, 
That's my hope. The problem is I can't. Can you get me on, on sharing my screen? That's my challenge. I can't get back to you. Ah. Hold on. Um... Yeah, I think you're going to have to get back to the StreamYard tab in order to reshare. I think we'll just have to do it manually, so sorry. I have all this nice, um, I have all these nice fancy um, animations, which I will not use today. So um, let me see. So this is as big as it's going to get. I'm, I apologize for that. Maybe that's a little bit better. It just doesn't have the animation. So here's our governance challenge. Um, and sorry about the, the lack of, of slides before. So as you can see, our watershed with 21 municipalities is only about the size of Amsterdam. So what we have done, meaning the cities and towns in the Mystic Watershed, is we have gathered together to do regional climate resilience because we realized that um, water, heat, storms do not, uh, they, they um, laugh at our municipal boundaries as they, as they blindly go flood from one community to another. So we decided we needed to work together on these um, common challenges. So um, the Mystic River Watershed Association and um, 20 cities and towns, you see up at the top, Wilmington only has the, you know, one knuckle of a pinky toe in our watershed, so they are not actively participating. But the rest of us um, are working together collectively on projects that keep us safe. And we were founded just under four years ago. Since then, we have secured about $30 million in regional climate funding. And um, we, have, we, we have applied for another, another $100 million, which is sort of extraordinary in terms of um, this small, mostly volunteer group. You know, this is uh, municipal staff and nonprofits. Are you seeing um, my window well at this point? Yep, looks What's great. You? Okay. So this is the vision that the municipal staff came up with. We don't wanna do a lot of training and planning. We wanna do stuff that makes people safe. Um, we start with data, we focus on projects, we're pragmatic, optimistic, we support each other, and that we're not afraid to fail and try something new. So um, this is where um, I think, but you are seeing the slides are going forward. Is what you're saying? You, you are seeing the slides go forward or not? Yes, yeah, we can see them. them. So what I'm just gonna do is delete things for the moment. So this is um, a map of, um, or it's not a map, it's an, it's an overhead photograph of the Malden River and the, and the Mystic River, the year my mom was born, which you know, she's still alive. It's not that long ago. And you can see these oxbows because this was a tidal river, river at the time. And you can see that the houses are really quite far away from the river because they knew that they flooded. This was still a, a tidal river at the time. This is what that looks like now. So we, so we put in a dam in the 1960s and moved everybody up right to the edge of the river. So we no longer have room to flood. Similarly, this is about a 144 year old map. And um, as Emily was showing, the um, gray areas are those salt marshes that are uh, really almost liquid land. Um, they flood at high tide and the full extent of them flood during storms. And so um, again, nobody was living in these marshes um, back then, but we, when we filled them, we have filled them with people and stuff. So the big challenge about that is that um, let me actually see if I can, um, 
do this one more time. Um, so this is this is just peeling back from, um, just zooming back. This is just a couple of years ago. Google Map. This is much of the Lower Mystic, and if you're remembering those um, old maps that Emily was showing, this is incredibly industrialized. It's it's uh, more than 50% covered with pavement and development. And then this is what the Mystic looked like in 1900, where it was still tidal. And you see all of that blue is really the, the extent of that liquid marsh. And um, if you can see my cursor, this is that island and river that really looked like almost like a head of broccoli. And then I'm sorry that the animation doesn't work because it sort of fades into each other. But what you can see is where those, um, let me cut this again, where all that marshland was, particularly those rivers. Um, oops, sorry. Um, that's where we're going to flood today. So this is the probability of flooding 50 years from now, when we have about four feet more sea level rise and our storms give us another foot of storm surge. So what that probability means is in the um, areas surrounding Boston Harbor, you can see this gray area. That is expected to flood with salt water, which is very corrosive about every year and a half. And with all that flooding, you can see those original outlines that Emily showed of the Suffolk, of the Shawmut Peninsula, Noddle Island, the islands that make up uh, Logan Airport. And then the other colors are areas that will flood less often, but still, you know, every 10 or 20 years. And salt water is extremely corrosive. It's not something you just dry out. It'll knock out your electrical conduits, um, it corrodes cement. So this is something, basically this is showing us the places that we need to protect from sea level rise, really by elevating either the shoreline or our resources because um, basically the ocean for all intents and purposes uh, is of infinite volume. You can't soak up the ocean and store it. You really just have to elevate things. So um, one of the questions we've had is um, that we have two dams that were built. The Charles River Dam was built about 100 years ago. Amelia Earhart Dam was built a little bit more than 50 years ago. And we've done all this building ever since. And again, all of that, that rainbow of colors, those were the areas that were very low-lying salt marshes and estuaries. The question is, um, by 2070, these two dams will overtop re relatively regularly. In fact, this is the Amelia Earhart Dam, so-called because she had family in Medford. But on the upstream side, the Mystic River itself is held at mid-tide. And the downstream side is allowed to go up and down with the tide. So high tide is about high, five feet higher than what the river is kept at normally. And then when we had some historically large flooding in 2018, it came within about a foot and a half of overtopping that dam. Um, and then if you look at that dotted line way above, um, just below the tidal, that is the flood elevation 50 years from now. So that would fully overtop the dam and in fact threaten the uh, structural integrity of the dam. So this was actually one of the key issues that brought this 20 community resilient mystic collaborative together. We were very concerned that the, the state didn't understand the, um, how vulnerable communities were to upstream flooding. And, uh, the agency was not particularly, um, responsive. So we, contacted the governor and got a, a quite uh, rapid and quite angry response. But once we started talking with each other, it was quite constructive. It turns out we were kind of talking past each other where 
the state was thinking that their job was to prevent the dam from breaking. And the communities had no idea that the dam had any risk of breaking. Their concern was that the dam functioned to not have water back up upstream of the dam and, and flood communities. So after a three year working group between the Resilient Mystic Collaborative and the state, we learned a lot. So one was that by 2050, with about five more feet of coastal flooding, coastal flood risk, um, sure, the dam's over top, but then there also become some other low-lying flood pathways where water can enter and flood inland communities. The other thing we learned is that there's no one community, even Boston, that can go it alone. All of these flood pathways keep coming in through other communities. So for example, Cambridge is outlined. Um, they flood from a number of different places, but none of that, um, do they own the land to do anything about it? So uh, Cambridge was actually the community that started this effort uh, for their own enlightened self-interest. And then the final thing is that this truly is a regional effort because flooding will always find the low spot. If you solve one issue by um, blocking the dam, say you block the Charles River Dam, but you don't block water coming in through Sullivan Square, you'll still get backdoor flooding. So our question became, all of us communities working together, and there's about nine communities working on this together, what will it take to keep the risk of flooding about the same it is as it is today, which is a quite low risk. How can we keep that same level of risk over the next 50 years when we have so much more coastal flooding? So what we did together is we, and I don't know if you can see me zoom in. I'm hoping you can. Um, there are these um, red marks are what we call flood pathways the two dams, but also eight other places that are low-lying areas that we also need to shore up. And so what we learned was if we do nothing and we have a the equivalent of a one in a hundred storm, we used to call it a one in a hundred year storm, but that assumed that climate doesn't change. So now we say it's a one in a hundred chance in a given year. So under a storm like that, all of this blue, air, all of this purple area would be flooded by salt water. If we are able to block those 10 flood pathways, all of that teal area stays dry. And it's protecting tens of thousands of people and billions of dollars of commercial and residential real estate. And the cost of this is something on the order of less than a half a billion dollars. So it's an enormous difference in terms of what it costs. And most of that is for the two dams. So what it costs versus um, the benefits. Now, all of this light green area, those are areas that will flood that aren't helped by this particular um, effort, but you sort of have to um, bite off what you can chew and right now we are focusing on sort of the elevating the two dams and the areas around the dams. But the area that's in uh, light green, that is the city of Boston. And then the area in purple are areas that um, are not being looked at yet. So once you have those uh, photos, you know, those maps, what do you do then? We lobby. So this, this is a group of um, municipal staff and nonprofit and uh, state representatives. And we have been working with them over the course of the last six to eight months. And they have put in a number of uh, lines in the state budget um, to put in state matching funds for federal grants uh, to elevate uh, several of these flood pathways, which would make an enormous difference. We are lobbying for federal funding, for state funding. Um, and, and this is where uh, one of my earlier slides where we've gotten $30 million of funding to date and have another 100 million to go. A lot of it is this 
coastal flood resilience um, efforts, but also heat and, and rainfall flooding. The other thing that's going on in this area is absolutely transformative um, development. So um, once the uh, seaport was completed um, in terms of development, um, the folks who had really gotten invested in seaport development said, well, where else, where's next? And they said, what's that uh, in the Lower Mystic? And the Lower Mystic really is the older port of Boston. It hasn't had a lot of investment since World War II. It doesn't have the um, deep water that you need for the enormous container ships that go into South Boston. And so this is sort of the out of sight, out of mind part of Boston Harbor with a big power plant and about a hundred oil terminals and all our road salt and all our heating oil and jet fuel and um, all of our fresh fruits and vegetables go through here. So it's quite industrial. Um, and as Emily said, this was all built on, on uh, marshes. Um, but now a lot of it is privately owned and those private landowners would like to develop. Um, and a lot of areas are, are already underway in redevelopment. So ExxonMobil had almost 100 acres, which is the size of uh, Boston Common. They just sold to Davis Companies, which is a local firm. Um, and Davis wants to make another uh, knowledge economy area there, like, like Kendall Square. The Schraff Center used to be the Schraff's Candy um, Center. That is also um, a big development that's looking for both residences and, um, again, a lot of knowledge economy, clean, clean commerce, um, not the not the old industry that that marked this area in the past. They're also really looking for a lot of good climate resilience and access to the water. Sullivan Square is another center of biotech. Uh, a group called Rise Together um, is pulling together a number of different developments. Somerville has created a um, plan for Assembly Row 2, which would double that uh, newly redeveloped area. And Assembly Row, because it used to be car factories where they were assembling cars, there's going to be a new pedestrian bridge connecting Everett to Somerville, which also connects bike paths all the way out to Lynn, and all the way down to Milton and all the way up to Concord. So when you look at this really transformative uh, development over the next 10 to 20 years, the question is what public benefits can we collectively secure with all of the public investment we're doing in coastal resilience and private investment into these new neighborhoods we're hoping that we can work together, uh, municipalities, neighborhood groups, um, state legislators and developers to look at um, how does everybody elevate to the same height to get rid of those um, flood pathways? How can we have an awesome um, connected series of neighborhood parks that would rival something that uh, Olmsted would have done um, and then as we are investing heavily in the knowledge economy, there's a lot of folks who live here now who won't have a chance to go to college. Can we make sure that they can still live here, afford housing and have jobs that don't require a degree? And then what else can happen here? This could be really a miracle uh, with all this new investment. Um, so that is our hope that we can um, look regionally and, and have the sum be or the, the whole be larger than the sum of its parts. So if you are interested in what we're doing, that is our website um, of the Resilient Mystic Collaborative. And um, thank you, I'm, I'm sorry about the technical difficulties and I look forward to the, our discussion. Thanks so much, Julie, that was great. Really like helpful to sort of understand all the things that are happening uh, and how different communities are kind of working together. One thing that jumped in my head as you were talking is I imagine the, um, and I'll, I'll give people a chance in the chat to post their questions. So I'll ask a question first, but I imagine, um, you know, visualization and being able to see the sort of 
and the risks and the sort of impact of those things is a big piece of advocacy work, but also kind of <clears throat> getting people that live in the area to understand kind of why it's important. And I wonder if you have any sort of thoughts or reflections from kind of all your work doing this of like, what are the challenges to that in making these kinds of, you know, the maps you showed? Um, mm -hmm. Are there things that work better than others to sort of get people to understand um, what the real risks are or is there are there things that you've learned we, we just don't we don't make maps that way anymore because they're confusing or something um just because I, I can imagine it's just such a big piece of kind of breaking down what's going on that's well, interesting um so we we collectively first put out um coastal flood maps in 2010 and nobody cared we were all thinking like, oh, what our poor grandchildren will have to deal with. And then Superstorm Sandy came along in uh, 2012, October 2012. And we re-released re those maps along with a short report called Preparing for the Rising Tide. And that went viral nationally because um, people realized that, oh my gosh, with Superstorm Sandy, hurricanes can really reach up into the Northeast, which we hadn't, you know, thought, oh, those poor Gulf states, Katrina will never happen here. Oh my gosh, we're at risk. So, it, and the original maps came out from a nonprofit that's now called Boston Harbor Now. Um, but then the state said, huh, I wonder if those maps are legit. Redid all of that um, research from a government point of view, said, holy smokes, it sure is. And with the government uh, legitimizing that research, um, that became the standard for development. So that actually, those maps are critical, especially since this area has not been hit with a Katrina or a Sandy or a Matthew or a Florence or a Maria, you know, all of the storms that people have been hit with. So those maps actually are enable us to plan ahead and try to make changes before the big one, hopefully, knock on wood. Um, so I would say that Boston is not as, far ahead as places that have already had a disaster, but is way further ahead because of those maps. But it's not just sticking the map on a website. I know that in the five years after Superstorm Sandy, I spoke with 20,000 people face-to-face -face with those maps, probably 50 people at a time, to walk people through and explain them. And I'm not alone in that. So it was a it was a person-to-person -person effort to, to get those to uh, be institutionalized. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense in terms of just having to really kind of make the case and be able to explain what's happening in them, socialize them before people sort of understand them as as sort of predictions of what's going, you know, what's at stake. Yeah. So I see um, in, a, in the chat, we've got a question from Mike um, who said, Boston zoning code does not mention earthquakes. Building code takes care of that. But Boston has areas that are vulnerable to liquefaction. Should that be reflected in zoning code? beyond my expertise, unfortunately. You know, I okay. do know that that's a, that's a legitimate concern given that we are built on muck. Mm -hmm. And um, I sure hope that earthquakes don't become a thing, but I, you know, there's another, there's other challenges. I'm gonna pivot Mike, cause I have nothing to say about earthquakes. But what, what I would say is one of the other challenges that we don't think about at all is that when you have water almost acts like tectonic plates. When you have sea level rise, you're actually gonna push up, is it gonna, which floats more? I think salt, salt water is heavier than fresh water. You're gonna push up groundwater. So one of the challenges we don't think about at all is with sea level rise, we're gonna actually have inland groundwater flooding. That is something we don't have zoning for either. So there's a lot of funky things. We don't have, we haven't really figured out um, material challenges with things like our winters are now having a lot of freeze thaw cycles. It used to be that our winters just stayed cold. Now we're having a lot of rain in the winter. We're having thaws in the winter. That's another challenge. So as much as I don't know much about earthquakes, the thing about climate change is high winds, freeze thaw, more flooding, more periodic drought. Those are all real challenges that we have not prepared for yet. 
Yeah, well, and we, we have a map that's in the show here that um, one of the sort of, I think, maybe sources of flooding that people either aren't as familiar with or just like it's it's kind of easy to forget about them until you see it happening or sort of stormwater mm -hmm. flooding and mm -hmm. the areas where stormwater flooding, you know, is is sort of a, a real risk, um, either given a heavy rainfall or some kind of like you were talking about basically uh, flooding where it's pushing everything else up and suddenly kind of sewer overflows or, or areas where um, kind of water pools on streets and near houses and stuff. Um, and that was, that's one of the things on that map that's, you know, as you go further inland where, you know, maybe it's not, it's not coastal sea level rise risk exactly, but it's sort of flooding nonetheless. Um, so it's, sure. it's interesting to hear that. And even uh, as we're working on our seawalls, there's things called, um, you know, stormwater outfall pipes that are, that are supposed to slope down, but with higher and higher water, that water can actually back up. So you can have salt water coming in really blocks inland that you didn't mm -hmm. expect. So some of what we need to do is put tide gates on some of these outfall pipes. Yeah, well, and that's actually, I was really interested when you were showing the, the kind of maps of, um, you know, where where blocks could actually really have an impact. And, you know, when it's not the dams and it's kind of the, some of those other areas, I was wondering right. what kinds of um, kind of interventions are the things that, that either civil engineers or, uh, I guess I don't know exactly which which group would be doing it, but what are the kinds of things that that happen that act as those blocks? Are they? Well, honestly, you want civil engineers, but you also want community engagement folks, and you also mm -hmm. want landscape architects because um, the most basic thing is just to stick a wall in vertically, but that's boring. You could have an amphitheater so people can actually walk into the water and enjoy it because we're also getting hot summers. You can have a living shoreline that has habitat. You can have fountains. You can have swimming barges. You know, you can you can both protect the city behind from flooding, but also make it incredibly enticing for people to access the water. And again, for, for low-income folks who can't go to the Cape or even go out to the Harbor Islands, these are the coolest places that will that will be as our summers get really hot. So we need shady interactive waterfronts. And, and so the, the engineer will understand what elevation is needed, but then we need a lot more creativity in terms of making them enticing for people. I think that's really well said. Uh, yeah, it helps, uh, you know, sort of think about what are the alternatives, what are the possibilities other than just sort of a concrete wall that acts as kind of a barrier, a flood barrier. Yeah. Um, Elise had a question um, and she's asking, what is the involvement of the municipal governments um, that are concerned? She lives in Medford and never has any, there's never any discussions about this issue. Um, I can't speak to the number of discussions in Medford, though I bet, you know, I know that there are sort of policy discussions like conservation commission or whatever. Um, but I, I'm assuming you're saying sort of broader newspaper um, discussions. And one of the challenges of what we're doing is we are going full blast on um, doing the research to say what's needed to happen um, to protect people and places from climate change. We are then working, we're getting funds to design areas. And then actually we do do quite a bit of community engagement, but it's very site specific. So I would say um, you can certainly contact me. Just Google my name. I'm quite easy to find. I'm the only Julie Wormser in the U.S., I guess, I've heard. Um, and I can help you get connected. But we, in terms of knowing about it um, ambiently, we, don't, we have not spent our resources on um, general communications. It's really been very, very project-specific work. And so I think that's probably why it's been quieter because uh, we're focused on like, how do we get this dam elevated? How do we get this bike path built? Whatever it is. Yeah, and speaking of those projects, Martha just put a comment in the chat and said, I saw that the new playground and bocce courts in the North yeah. End, is that what you're referring to with landscape architects so and civil engineers? That is, that is a wonderful example of a great park. So it's Langione Park, I think. Um, I was not involved with it, but it's a perfect example. So that is a park. That was a flood pathway going right into the north end. They made it into an incredibly cool park. 
And some of the flood barriers are just great benches. It's the back mm -hmm. of the bench, so that's the area, but your feet would get wet, the back wouldn't. And then they have very, they have much smaller openings that would be blocked off for a storm. And they just did a lot of really great park amenities as they made this part of the um, flood resilience. So that's an incredibly good example. Um, I guess to, to finish Elisa's question, um, Alicia Hunt uh, is the person who is working most closely with us. And she is in this, it's a, she's a senior municipal staff. So I uh, am paid full time to facilitate the Resilient Mr. Collaborative along with a couple other people. But the decision makers are senior municipal staff predominantly engineers and planners, and to some extent, public health commissioners. Awesome. But yes, Martha, that's a perfect example of what we're trying to accomplish, absolutely. And Moakley Beach is another one, uh, Moakley Park, sorry, Carson Beach, Moakley Park in South Boston and Dorchester is another example of a place that's flood prone, but they're gonna do a lot of great park um, amenities to make it a great place to be. That sounds great. Sounds like we might need to go uh, take a field trip there as staff. That might be our next uh, our next out of office outing. Yep. Walk over from the library. Okay. Well, I am not seeing any more questions in the chat, so I will start the wrapping up process. But if people have questions, feel free to add them, and we can we can grab them as they come in. Um, mostly, thank you so much to the Meyer staff. We so grateful that you all came on and Julie that was an amazing presentation so I Megan and I are really grateful um oh Mike has another question okay I will jump over this and then this will this might be the last question who should pay who should which pay I'm it? assuming is 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 in in the context of those projects or different kinds of interventions it is a great question and what I would say is that to date a lot, particularly in Boston, the folks who have predominantly been paying um, are, are private developers. So basically they get the right to put market rate, which is pretty high end, uh, predominantly residential and commercial development right in the watershed. And in return, they elevate the shoreline. The problem with that as a model is that you drive gentrification and um, economic displacement that way. So unless you redevelop an area from a low income place to a high income place, um, you don't get climate resilience. So my, in, if I were czar, I would redistribute some of our wealth. We have extraordinary private wealth in the Boston area. We, I'm, I don't know how many billionaires we have in the Boston area. We need to actually redistribute wealth for the MBTA, for climate resilience, for our common wealth. We have not invested enough in the public realm really since the 50s, 60s. Um, and part of what, you know, just as we did the big dig, just as we did the Boston Harp cleanup, we need to actually share the cost of elevating our shoreline such that we don't have wealthy neighborhoods that'll do fine and the poor neighborhoods turn, turn into slums because they, they couldn't afford it. So in, in, in my sense, this is part of the Commonwealth and we need to um, raise dedicated funds to do this. Okay, our last question here uh, came from Erica who was asking, um, she's a teacher and also a former landscape architect and was part of something with the Stone Living Lab um, that was reaching out to teachers this summer, participated in a workshop. And there's a lot that Erica's gonna take back to their classroom at, the, at their school and um, is asking kind of one, how can teachers and students collaborate in this work and what's happening? And then also specifically kind of thinking about nature-based solutions versus more rigid kind of constructed solutions, if there's kind of any thoughts you have on those. Yes, I'm, I'm Natalia, I'm giving you a, a heads up that I'm going to throw the how can we get involved question back to you. But to answer the nature-based solutions versus Rigid constructed is in in the inner harbor of Boston Harbor, where you have a huge amount of large boat traffic. Very difficult to do nature-based solutions, where you have intense wave action. Those nature-based solutions aren't necessarily soft, but they could be bumpy, rocky, so that you could have 
seaweed start to construct habitat. Um, a lot of the nature-based solutions tend to be really good for water quality, tend to be outstanding for heat. They're not necessarily outstanding for sea level rise and coastal storms. It's a really contextual thing. So for us, we lean in as much as possible on nature-based co-benefit solutions uh, for sure, um, low maintenance solutions, but they don't always work in a place like Boston that is pretty heavily developed. You can't have, you, you know, those marshes, we took that land um, and it's hard to rebuild those marshes unless you have neighborhoods really retreat back, which will happen at some point when seas get too high. Um, but I, I would probably for a place, an urban area, talk about co-benefits, maybe not as, not as much nature-based solutions. Nature-based at a small um, scale, but in places like Marshfield, which with its name is a marshy field, that you can do more nature-based solutions. Natalia? Thanks, Julie. And great to see you here in this presentation, Erica. And I'm sure you remember our visit to Blessing of the Bay with your students uh, last year to talk about stormwater. And I'm glad you brought this up because I think it's really been a goal of mine to involve youth and families in the process of um, engineering these solutions and, and as a, a professional development opportunity for students to learn about that, that um, area of work. And so um, aside from our volunteer opportunities, there aren't really any direct ways that students and, and teachers uh, per se can be involved um, in this work. So I guess I'll, I'll kind of uh, ask you to share a little bit about what you think, Julie, and how we can maybe start involving youth uh, more directly in this type of engineering um, work that we lead. Well, I would say again, um, the challenge is there's so much work to be done that we are focusing our resources on projects. And so we have not done as much communications, public education as we'd hoped. But places like the Boston Society of Architects have outstanding curricula on climate and the built environment. Natalia does these amazing um, field visits, classroom visits, and we can do a curriculum that's not about students getting involved in the projects, but students learning about the projects and thinking about how they could do that as a career. Um, places like Deer Island Sewage Treatment Plant has some really good curricula. So there's a lot of STEM place-based curricula on climate. And unfortunately, um, we're sprinting and uh, we, we are, we are um, raising funds all the time and ultimately we will do a better job on public engagement. But right now it's very project focused. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> anyway, yeah, I am leading. I just wanted to mention a kind of the um, integration of more climate and, and heat resilience in particular, we lead a Wicked Hot Mystic project, which is um, measuring uh, heat throughout the Boston area and, and providing uh, resources for uh, communities that experience the worst impacts of heat, for example. So that is something that we're starting to kind of um, lead more of an education front to, to share with youth um, about you know, um, ways that they can um, help us, to, for example, design like parks and paths um, in uh, areas like Charlestown. We're doing a lot of work there, um, designing designing paths um, that have access to the river and parks. So um, a little bit in, of that is happening, um, but we're kind of in the beginning stage of, yeah. of incorporating those kind of um, and Erica, as you know, we, we do have students help us count herring because we have a fantastic, humble um, wildlife migration happening just as we speak, as the herring make their way from the ocean up to the Mystic Lakes to make more baby herring. We have lots of uh, classrooms helping us count. So we, we do do a lot of STEM education, just not as much on our climate projects. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you all. So we're going to put um, a link to our website, um, lemthalmap.org, 
in the chat. So if you're looking for more uh, kind of map related, environmental justice related content, check out our website. Our exhibition, more or less in common, um, will be up until the end of the year. Um, and we're also going to put the Myra um, website in the chat so that if you want to learn more, um, we've already put the volunteer opportunity. So if you're interested, check that out. Um, and otherwise, we hope we will see you at our next uh, event. So thank you all. Have a good rest of your night.